The impact of Advent is massive. In this sermon series, we'll hear some of the voices of Advent and see that when mercy draws near, it gives birth to humble participation, compassionate integrity, and worshipful proclamation. And these are only a few of the countless voices that testify of how the Advent season redeems and renews. So may our voices also be among them during this season. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. Back in 2001, uh, just a, a long line of an embarrassing moments for me, uh, December 19th of 2001, Marshall was playing in the, the GMAC Bowl. We always play in the best bowls. Uh, Marshall does. Yeah, exactly. You can say that. It's true. It's sad. But this was a great game. If you're old enough to remember, and if you're even a Marshall fan, uh, they were losing terribly at halftime, I think by 30 points, and they stormed back in the second half. They ended up winning in double overtime. The final score was 64-61. to 61. Byron Leftwich was, was the quarterback, and it was one of the, the highest scoring games, I think, in, at the time, certainly, in college uh, football history. So uh, in the wake of this victory, a lot of things I'm ashamed of happened. I was with a few of my friends, and we were so excited that at one point there was a fire extinguisher that someone had in their hands that, that I became sprayed with along with everyone else uh, at this uh, watch party. But then I went out and it's freezing cold. It's December the 19th. It's after 11 p.m., maybe even after midnight. And I'm driving up and down the roads of West Huntington where all the wonderful people live. And I have my arm out the window with a Marshall flag and I'm honking the horn, screaming out the window, we are Marshall. Nobody cared, <laughs> except for who is this crazy person and why will they not? Why will they not shut up? But listen, nobody had to coach me to do that. I was thrilled with this victory. In fact, people had to coach me not to do <laughs> stuff like that. But here's the point: in the wake of this incredible thing at the time, which was super important to me. I just exploded with proclamation of what had happened. I didn't have to be coaxed into it. I didn't have to be uh, drug into it. I just, I just did it. It's Christmas Eve tonight. And what I want us to see is that when mercy draws near, it gives birth to worshipful proclamation. That the response to mercy drawing near through Jesus Christ is for us to go out and proclaim it with joy. For us to sit here and sing about it together with joy. When mercy draws near, it gives birth. It's a worshipful proclamation. You see, Advent has an impact. We've seen that the last uh, three times we've gathered, or this will be the third time we see that. With Mary, we saw that, that mercy has the impact of leading to humble obedience with Joseph, we saw that, that Advent has this impact of compassionate integrity in his life. And tonight we'll see the shepherds, and Mary as well. She doesn't always get a lot of press in this, in this specific passage, but she's there too. That mercy gives birth to worshipful proclamation. Two things. We're almost there. The finish line is, is here of the Christmas season. I don't want us to miss the mercy. I don't want us to miss the wonder. It's so easy to miss it. If you're anything like me, you get to the 23rd, the 24th, and you start thinking, I just have not tasted the magic. I just haven't tasted the wonder of the season. My prayer is that we don't escape without seeing the mercy of God. And then, too, that in that way, we will proclaim the goodness of Jesus. But, Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us. And what we are not, please make us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 say, and we just heard them. Great job, by the way. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with fear. 
There's a lot in these verses, actually. The, 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 the Word of God is very, very deep. For the sake of time, I'm going to give you a scripture. For those of you that like really kind of geek out over this kind of stuff, you can write this down. Jeremiah 33, verses 13 through 16. Jeremiah 33, verses 13 through 16. If, if, if you're wondering why the shepherds are about to be the ones who receive the, the first announcement post-birth of Jesus, there's a lot of reasons that people will offer up. One of them is found in Jeremiah 33. There is a, actually a prophecy that, that Jesus will come while shepherds are watching their sheep. It's a lesser cited prophecy, but it's there. And there's also the royal line of David. And there's symbolism there that, that it would be shepherds that hear this. But here's what I think the main point is for why he comes to the shepherds. It's because I believe mercy always finds its way into the margins. Mercy always finds its way to the marginalized, to the weak, to the broken, to the outcasted. Philip Riken sums it up like this. He says, shepherds were outcasts, and thus their presence at the manger shows that salvation is for everyone. Don't miss that. We tend to romanticize the shepherds, especially since there are so many good shepherds in the Bible. People like David, who we revere. But they did not enjoy a very good reputation in their day. Because they lived out in the fields, they were unable to keep the ceremonial law. There was a hygiene aspect to the ceremonial law that they would not have been able to practice in the fields. And thus, they were treated as unclean. They were also regarded as liars and thieves which is why their testimony was inadmissible in the court of law. Shepherds were despised. With the exception of lepers, they were the lowest class of men in Israel. This is who gets the birth of Nazareth. The shepherds, the outcasts, the people on the margins. By the way, one of my favorite apologetics for the truth of the gospel story is how whack the marketing strategy is. It just doesn't make sense. Like, if you were to sit down a bunch of a bunch of Jewish men and say, let's make something up that we can trick everybody into believing and we'll form this fake world religion, right? You wouldn't put so many marginalized people as the main testifiers to the truth of it. The disciples were a rabble. The shepherds couldn't even be admissible in court. And who witnesses the resurrection first? Women. Their, their testimony was not admissible in court either. So you talk about a, a terrible marketing strategy. The truth of the gospel uh, is true, not because of some great marketing strategy, but because it is, in fact, true. Virgin birth, shepherds, women, those are just part of the story. But on the front edge of all the highest points of the gospel, hear me tonight, are the people who are in the market. Marginalized, weak, broken people. And the gospel is exactly what the angels bring. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good, no good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. The gospel is good news. Not to beat a dead horse, but it is good news for losers. It's good news for broken people. It's good news for marginalized people. It's good news for the weak. It's good news for the stuck. It's good news for the hurting. It's good news for the ceremonially unclean. It's good news for the overwhelmed. It's good news for you. It's good news for me. It was good news for a young Nazarite woman. It was good news for a carpenter who would uh, not be believed for his entire life. And it's good news for these despised shepherds. If mercy is to be received, it will be received by those who are in the margins, and if we are to embody mercy and extend mercy, we must go to the margins with it. So mercy is in the margins. It's for people in the margins. And one of the most vivid proofs of that is in our next verse, or verses 11 and 12. For unto you, this is the announcement of the angel, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and 
This will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Two things here. There's a who and there's a where. The who, there's actually four titles or four things about Jesus that are told here. City of David, that, that goes back to that Second Samuel 7 prophecy. That the line of David, someone from his, one of his sons would sit on the throne forever. So this is the Davidic king promised. He's not just the royal son, but he's also the savior. He will rescue people. And he's the Christ. It's a word for Messiah. The promised one. That's who he is. And then for the first time in scripture ever, we see the word Christ and the Lord butted up against each other. The promised one is not just a man. He is God. God with skin on. Fully God fully man. That's the incarnation. Right? It's so easy to just glide right past that. Straight to the busyness of the season, the God of the universe. Right? Who created the womb of Mary will enter into the womb of Mary. The God who created the legs will have to learn how to walk on kids. Jesus is God with skin on. We don't just learn about who, we learn about where. He's in the manger. Now this is what, this is one of the things that most affirms the fact that mercy is for those in the margins. Is the fact that here he is in the manger. Saint, Saint B, the Venerable, a 15th or a 5th century monk in England said these words. It should be carefully noted that the sign given of the Savior's birth is not a child enfolded in Tyrian purple, but one wrapped round with rough pieces of cloth. He is not to be found in an ornate golden bed, but in a manger. The meaning of this is that he is, did not merely take upon himself our lowly mortality. He didn't just become a man and with that uh, embrace just the fatigue and the, and the ability to, to, to be crucified as a man, but he also, for our sake, took upon himself the clothing of the poor. Mercy is in the margins because Jesus comes and sets up his station in the margins. So verses 8 through 10 are mercy in the margins. Verses 11 and 12 are mercy in the manger. Have you pondered the manger this year? Have you ever thought about the reality that, that the King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, would stoop so low? We recognize Jesus by his unyielding humility. And you'll know you're starting to look more like Jesus when you display unyielding humility. So we see mercy in the margins. We see mercy in the manger, this promised Messiah born unto you. So the angel says to the, to the shepherds, normally you would say, a baby has been born to Paul and Sarah Bokel. His name is Isaiah. These guys aren't family. Not yet. <laughs> Through faith, they're going to be. Through faith, they're going to be family. And the birth announcement comes to them as if they are. And it comes to you tonight that same way. Unto us, a son is given. So mercy comes down and it gets low. But just because mercy comes low does not mean it's not worthy of the highest praise. And so in verses 13 and 14, we see mercy in the highest. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is the third Christmas carol in Luke, by the way. If you're reading Luke and you see those indented portions in your Bible. Those are songs or, or poems. This is the third one. There'll be a fourth. Simeon's going to sing when he meets Jesus in the temple before we get out of, of chapter 2. Mary sang one. Zechariah sang one. 
and hear the angels sing. We're going to sing five tonight just so we can do it better than they did. We, we don't want to be shown up uh, by Luke and his gospel. So, But there's four songs there. That's the response of the people. Bear with me, if you will. Can you imagine being the angel, one of the angels that gets this assignment, right? Now, we know Clarence wasn't there because he hadn't got his wings yet. Hadn't met George Bailey. If you haven't watched It's a Wonderful Life and you don't get that joke, then get right with God. And uh, before this, this year is out, you should try to correct that. So Clarence wasn't there, but imagine just, you know, some random angel has had this assignment. Since Jesus, or since God promised Adam and Eve that a snake crusher would come and crush the head of the serpent, she's been waiting, or he's been waiting. They've been at rehearsal every day for a thousand years. And now the call comes. Where are we going? Palace? No. Where are we going? Town Square? No. Where are we going? Shepherds. Outcast. The marginal. And they go and they sing about two things, glory and peace. Yeah. Glory, obvious. This plan is too wonderful for any man to think of. So the glory goes to God. And then they talk about peace. We long for peace. Desperately. Sometimes more than others. Sometimes things might be going so well in life that we, that we think we found it. But if I'm, unless I miss my guess, every person in this room has felt what it is like to desperately yearn for peace. We long for it. And it's promised here, but it's promised to those with whom God is pleased. Not to everyone. To those with whom God is pleased. But the most wonderful thing about it is that that baby boy in that manger will purchase the pleasure of God at the cross. At the cross, he will be crucified. He will give his blood out of his hands and his feet and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, will make it possible for us to be made right with God. It's interesting, and, and J.C. read these words, the story begins with Caesar Augustus. Caesar of Rome. Rome had an expression. Pax Romana. Peace through Rome. They don't want a real peace. The Hebrews had an expression, shalom. Peace from God. The peace that Rome brought came with slavery. It came with poverty. It came with an iron fist. It came through death and violence. That's how Pax Romana came. The shalom comes through a baby boy who will grow old and yes it will come through violence but all of that violence will be poured out on Jesus he will absorb the violence he will absorb the wrath of God so that we can be made right with God Shalom is far far greater than Pax Romana Colossians 1 19-20 for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell that's Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That peace is ours through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That's what the angels proclaim. They proclaim the gospel. And the gospel demands a response. And that's where we close. You see, the three sermons we've had this Advent season have all been heavily about the mercy of God. Because they're not primarily about our response. Because we can't generate any of these things on our own. We can only become these types of people if we ourselves have received mercy. If we've been impacted by the advent of Jesus with us. And so the bulk of every sermon has been about what Jesus has done. But of course, we close with our response. Because if mercy has been received, then mercy will be extended. And so as we wrap up, the last thing I want us to see is mercy in the message. The message of worshipful proclamation that both Mary, as we'll see, and the shepherds proclaim. 
The first thing I want us to see that we all need to do, and if we haven't done it yet this season, now's the time. Make haste to the manger. Verse 15 and 16, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Make haste to the manger. Go there. Behold, God with skin on. He has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Make haste to the manger. And notice, too, they didn't seek him and come up empty. Those who seek Jesus will find Jesus. Guaranteed. So make haste to the manger and then make known the message of mercy. Verses 17 and 18. And when they saw it, they saw Jesus and Mary and the Joseph. They, they saw it exactly as God had promised it. They made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. Now in these last two verses, we, we kind of see two ways that mercy is proclaimed. That, that worshipful proclamation happens. So as we close, two things. Make it known to yourself and two, make it known to others. Mary has this approach. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. She doesn't go running out yet. She doesn't go shouting it from the rooftops. But what she's doing is very, very important. She's treasuring the story of the gospel. She's holding on to it. She's loving it. But she's not just loving it. She's pondering it. And this word means to actually... Like, meditate on it, and not just meditate on it, but question it and, and seek clarity about it, and to actually dive into it further. So there's two lessons that Mary gives us. One, come to the gospel and ask questions. Come to the Word of God and ask questions. It's okay to bring your doubts to the Word of God. It can handle it. Bring them. Bring your questions. Bring your concerns. Ponder. Think on it. But at the same time, Mary's posture is one of love and treasure. If this is true, she's thinking it changes everything. I want this to be true. This has to be true. Life is worthless if this is not true. And she loves it and longs for it. So proclaim the gospel to yourself. Make it known to yourself. And then two, make it known to the masses. Last verse. And the shepherds returned. Glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Now I imagine that that might have gone over as well as my Marshall stuff did because it, it's probably pretty late at night. And they're running around through the city screaming about a virgin who's given birth to a son who is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But they didn't care. And they weren't scholars either, right? They didn't have some like really intricate plan about how they were going to share the gospel. They didn't have like seven steps or the Romans road or any of that. What did they do? They talked about what they'd seen and they talked about what they heard. They talked about what they knew about Jesus and they talked about what they had experienced in Jesus. So, the challenge for us is the same. To go forth from this place and to Proclaim the gospel to others simply by sharing what we know and what we've experienced. How has Jesus changed your life? So mercy in the margins, mercy in the manger, mercy in the highest, and mercy in the message. Now that's a cute enough way of saying it, right? Like how, you know, how cool is that? You're going to have it alliterated that way. Not that cool. What's it mean to us today? What do we take away as we as we close out this gathering? Three things. Partake in mercy. It's for us. It's for you tonight. Partake in it. If you're not a Christian, trust Jesus tonight. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16.31 says, and you will be saved. That mercy can be yours tonight for the very first time. Believe 
on the Lord Jesus Christ. That his finished work on the cross is enough to make you right with God. In Christian Ecclesiastes, are reminded that, that his mercies are made new every morning. You know why they're made new every morning? Because I need them every morning. Mercy is not a one-time thing for the child of God. You need it every day. So keep seeking mercy. Don't stop receiving it. Don't ever start thinking you don't need it. You still need mercy. Partake of it. So partake of mercy. Ponder mercy. Keep loving it. What's your plan for 2021? For how you're going to stir your affections for Jesus. What are the things that when you do them, whether it's music or a walk in the woods or whatever it is, that makes you just deeply feel the presence of God? That makes you rejoice in who Jesus is. Carve your your schedule, those things into your schedule. But don't just stir your affections, but also keep learning about it too. That might not be as fun as, as some of those more worshipful experiences, but, but learn. Read, listen, ponder. Increase your knowledge. And then lastly, proclaim. Who will you tell? And when will you tell? I can't answer that question for you. But who will you tell about Jesus? And when will you tell? When mercy draws near, it gives birth to humble, worshipful proclamation. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you sent Jesus. Might we not miss the wonder of that? Might we be moved by that? And might we... Receive your mercy over and over and over again, partaking of it. May we ponder on your mercy. And may we proclaim it to others. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. And if you haven't already, we would love for you to join the work of God as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at our website at www.mercyvillage.church.